Hello, and welcome to the Albright Scholar for January 2021. My name is John Pankratz. I teach history at Albright, and each month it's my privilege to welcome BCTV viewers and residents of Greater Reading to take a glimpse inside our learning community up here on North 13th Street to look at the work being done by teachers and students and to think about its impact on all of us. Well, it's January of a new year, a, a year that we've been looking forward to and a year that we're a little bit uncertain <laughs> of uh, now that it's begun. Um, Albright uh, is in the middle of an extended interim uh, semester uh, where a number of students are taking special courses or even two special courses and where uh, faculty colleagues are, are busy in instructing them online on some fascinating topics. And I thought I'd take uh, the opportunity of the interim and special topic courses uh, to talk with one of my favorite colleagues, uh, Dr. Chuck Brown, professor of sociology at Albright for about 20 years, right, Chuck? Uh, yeah. And uh, talk with him about a, a course that he's taught a number of times uh, uh, about uh, cults, religious cults, and new religious movements uh, from the perspective of, of a sociologist. Uh, Chuck, welcome to the Albright Scholar. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, John. I appreciate it. Now, I know we said that uh, uh, you're uh, teaching remotely and online, and I should point out that we're, of course, doing the program uh, very remotely. We're, we're in two different time zones. I'm back here in my office uh, at Albright, and you're uh, there in your uh, folks' kitchen uh, in Oregon. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, here in Oregon. Uh, as you can see from the background, my uh, stepmother has been uh, busy quilting. This is uh, actually the, uh, the it's a combination room quilting, uh, pool table, which you can't see, and computer room. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And, and it's your classroom now as well, since you're, uh, since you're teaching uh, an online version of this course. Yeah, that's correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, now, Cults and New Religious Movements is a course that you've taught almost since you first arrived here, right? Yeah. Uh, the first time I taught it, I think it was the second year I arrived here in 2002 during the interim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, why does it work so well as an interim course? Well, I, I think that uh, it, it works well because, uh, first of all, I, as you know, the interim is uh, a condensed format, so we're moving right. very quickly. And uh, one of the things that uh, I was actually initially concerned about when I first taught the course was how well the students would be able to handle the material because we were moving so quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, for my first uh, foray into the interim, I thought I needed a course that could hold the students' attention uh, because yeah. we were moving quickly. And this one seemed to fit the bill and it's worked really well so far. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating topic and, and it's a topic that has uh, shifted ground uh, uh, over the decades uh, as well. Uh, new religious movements don't hold still. Uh, there are still newer religious movements emerging uh, all, all the time. Um, could you talk a little bit about a sociologist's approach to the phenomenon of uh, religion and religiosity? Uh, we think sure. of religion as belief, as faith, as emotions, as passion, uh, and yet none of those things are, are what a sociologist is supposed to bring to his work. Yeah, that's correct. I, uh, I often start off the first day uh, reminding students that this is a course in the sociology of religion and new religious movements. And as such, uh, we won't be delving into the truth claims of any particular religions, uh, particularly the ones that, that we're uh, looking at. And uh, it's not a course in attempting to find ultimate truth. I encourage them to do that, certainly on their own time. I think it's absolutely worthwhile. But uh, here we're, we're really interested in the scientific study of uh, religion. So uh, basically what that entails is that we're looking at how religion affects individuals and society as a whole and vice versa, how uh, we in, in turn affect religion. It's that dynamic process. So we're looking at various things like, uh, for example, why people join uh, new religious movements in the case of, of this particular course. Uh, we look at the impact of uh, secularization and uh, how that's 
changed uh, recruitment patterns and things of that nature. Uh, I, I also point out that uh, we're looking at this from uh, as much as we can, a non-biased perspective. We don't want to come in with our own personal biases, which is obviously very hard. We all have them, but we try to bracket those off as sociologists and look at this from a scientific perspective. And uh, we're looking at it from an empirical perspective as well. So when we're looking at uh, the research, we're looking at how the data has been gathered, um, what methodologies they're using, what, what uh, sometimes uh, works well in certain contexts, might not work well in other contexts. And so we talk a little bit about uh, what's the best way uh, to, to study um, the, uh, the phenomenon of new religious movements, uh, specifically depending on what it is that we're interested in. Are we looking at, uh, for example, why people join or why people leave? Is it better to interview them, survey them, that sort of thing? Okay, okay. And do, do you find that students enjoy that I guess detachment, the the ability to look at something that is is deeply emotional, uh, and yet look at it without those emotions engaged. I've been really impressed. Uh, I've been teaching this course now for twenty years or so, yeah. And I think I, I, I was just uh, the other day looking at how many times I, I've taught it. I think it's over twenty now, and uh, I've been really really impressed with the ability of our students to to look at it from uh, you know new religious movements from the perspective of a scientist. I think they do a really good job of uh, you know, understanding that uh, we all have our biases, understanding what their partic uh, particular biases are, and not letting that uh, enter into the discussions that we have. Yeah, I, I think it's such an important uh, approach that the social, social sciences take uh, in general. And uh, there might be some lessons for our broader culture. Uh, uh, as well, to be able to exercise a, a bit of distance and a little bit of what, objectivity, uh, uh, some empiricism rather than uh, uh, simply trying to assert one's own values all the, uh, all the time. Yeah, certainly. And, uh, you know, what, one of the things that I initially uh, will bring up is uh, the issue of, of evolution, because I realized that this is a topic that, again, many students have been uh, exposed to, and there's always the question of, okay, uh, in, in courses like this, uh, when we're talking about religion, what's the role of, um, you know, for example, uh, intelligent design, uh, individuals that, that might believe in intelligent design as opposed to evolution and how these things fit. And I tell them, look, uh, you know, science doesn't have all the answers, and uh, we do have rules that we have to play by. And so we're not uh, here, again, to discuss the, uh, the importance of uh, you know, intelligent design or the importance of evolution necessarily. We, we want to look in at uh, both those perspectives, understand that, that they're out there. But again, this is a, a, a scientific course, and so we need to play by the rules of science. Uh, that's not to say that, uh, again, we shouldn't entertain uh, uh, questions of our own spirituality, but uh, in this course, we really need to look at it from a scientific perspective. And they do a great job. That's great. That's great. Are there particular uh, cults or movements that you've uh, focused on in the course? Yeah, we um, we talk about a number of course uh, or of uh, new religious movements. Uh, the first one that we spend the most time on is, of course, uh, one that a lot of people are familiar with, at least in passing, and that is the People's Temple, um, you know, Jonestown, sometimes referred to as Jonestown. And uh, from there we move on, uh, we talk about uh, the Branch Davidians, mm -hmm. we talk about uh, a, a group known as Om Shinrikyo from Japan, mm -hmm. uh, Solar Temple, uh, the Montana Freeman, which is a very interesting group. Um, we also talk about uh, Chen Dao, and uh, every now and then uh, we'll talk about other groups as, uh, as discussions come up. Uh, one of my um, groups that uh, I often bring up that many have not heard of is uh, a group that um, was actually here in Oregon for a while. And uh, this is a, a group that uh, had basically taken over a small town of Antelope. Uh, the leader of what was uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Some people um, mm -hmm. may have heard of him, but uh, most people have not. And so we'll, we'll often talk about Rajneesh Piram and uh, the Rajneeshis a little bit, not too much. Right. Uh, have, have you... Um brought the story up to uh, uh, the QAnon uh, viewpoint yet? No, we haven't really talked about that. Uh, 
mostly because uh, I try to focus on new religious movements and there's uh, obviously a certain amount of material that I want to get through. And um, because I'm teaching it remote, uh, we don't have, uh, in, in many cases, I would say, uh, the discussions that we might no, you know, necessarily have uh, uh, in the classroom, um, things are a little more structured, obviously, whereas I think in the classroom, those topics tend to come up a little more. Uh, is, uh, you know, obviously students are watching the news or, or listening to the news or, or coming across uh, you know, various uh, topics that can bring them up in class. Whereas uh, online, um, the way that I typically structure the course, it's asynchronous, uh, there are discussion questions, and sometimes those things will come up, but not as often. Right, it, it takes a little bit more to try to introduce that. Whereas if, uh, if you've come fresh from watching the news or listening to the news or uh, checking out social media and you uh, all report to class at the same time, uh, yeah. then those topics will be on people's uh, lips and, and in their minds. That's Absolutely. Interesting. That's Absolutely. interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, as, as you know, I'm an American historian, and so uh, I'm fascinated by contemporary American society and the emergence of uh, different belief systems and faith traditions. Uh, but it's an old story in the United States, right? One, one of the things about the so-called New World is that uh, people from all over have generated um, uh, different spiritual uh, foci and, and uh, rituals and uh, belief systems. A lot of new churches have emerged in the American past. Um, and I guess the, the question is, what makes a new religious movement uh, durable? Uh, what, what, what makes it last? What gives it a future rather than simply uh, the fashion of the present? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, a question that we uh, we certainly address. Uh, in fact, right now we're uh, my, my students just finished up module two, and in that module, we discuss uh, how we define a new religious movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, sociologists, of, of course, tend to use the term new religious movement or alternative religion as opposed to cult because of the negative connotations. Uh, right. And I very often have to uh, you know inform students that uh, you know we. I might use the term cult, you might use the term cult, but what we're really talking about is a new religious movement. And uh, one of the things that uh, I had them watch is a video that talks a little bit about the emergence of Christianity and Islam, as well as other religions. And it points out that all religions were, of course, new at one time. And uh, all religions were often referred to as cults by those, uh, you know, uh, essentially in, in that time period. Uh, you know, Christianity, of course, uh, there, were, there were claims in early Christianity of, of individuals consuming flesh and drinking blood and, you know, all of these sorts of things. And uh, the students, uh, it, it's interesting, you know, again, I, as I mentioned, I've taught this course over 20 times now, and every time students are, you know, they'll say, wow, I, I never really thought about this, that uh, Christianity or uh, Buddhism or Islam would have been thought of as a cult at one time, but now that I, you know, we discuss it and th I think about it and, uh, you know, read about it and, and watch these videos, it starts to make sense. Now, of course, uh, most new religious movements are short-lived. They tend to be pretty small. Mm -hmm. Some endure, certainly. Um, and what makes them endure? Uh, there's, a, I suppose, a lot of facets that, that come into that. Um, one of, uh, of which, of course, I think would be how well it resonates uh, you know, with the, the uh, uh, overall society, um, you know, the, the, uh, the principles, I suppose, that, that, uh, uh, that are at the core of that particular new religious movement. Um, I think that some groups ha have a, a difficult time because uh, some of the, uh, the beliefs, uh, at least from our perspective as outsiders, tend to be very fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. I think of, for example, uh, groups like um, some of the uh, uh, UFO, new, UFO new religious movements, uh, like the um, uh, Heaven's Gate group that a lot of people may be familiar with. Um, that's a group that uh, if, if you start dissecting their, their belief system, I think a lot of us would, would sort of step back and say, wow, that seems really fantastical. And on top of that, uh, you know, to become a member of that group, there were a lot of sacrifices that had to be made, uh, many of which uh, I think most people would not be willing to do so. Uh, for example, giving up sex in the case of, of Heaven's Gate, that's a mm -hmm. hard sell for a lot of people. 
And, right. uh, you know, the members uh, of that group had to remain celibate. Uh, males in particular, uh, some of the males had uh, a difficult time uh, with their urges and they went so far as to go down into Mexico and have themselves castrated. And for a lot of people, again, that's, uh, that's a little much and uh, they're not, they obviously would not feel comfortable with those types of sacrifices. So I think the, the, the groups that tend to, uh, tend to resonate and tend to have uh, longevity uh, are also those that uh, are able to more easily sell their doctrines and probably don't ask a lot in the way of sacrifice. There, there's that fine balance. You have to ask mm -hmm. enough to where you feel like you're getting people committed and people feel like they're, they're uh, a part of something and uh, doing important work and they're committed to that work, but not so, um, so much that they feel that uh, too much is being asked of them. Right. You th I think of uh, the religious uh, churches that uh, emerged in the late 18th and then early 19th centuries, such as the Shakers or uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Shakers, of course, uh, promoting a separation of the, uh, of the sexes and ce celibacy. Uh, there aren't many Shakers around anymore, uh, and yet the, the Mormons, uh, while their uh, beliefs were distinctive from mainstream Christianity at the time, uh, have continued to adapt and have been uh, a welcoming enough institution uh, that they're one of the more most successful churches in the United States today. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, adaptability is key. Right, right, right. Um, are there, as as students engage uh, with this material, uh, what what kinds of discoveries are they making or in, in what ways do they see something that they'd never really thought of before? You alluded to that earlier, but uh, what other fresh insights are they developing as, as uh, they engage with the topic? Well, I think one of, uh, one of those is the, uh, you know, how the group is portrayed, um, both uh, you know, from society's perspective as well as the media in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes uh, in the case of law enforcement, I think a lot of them are, are surprised to learn that uh, not all new religious movements are violent. Uh, I think that we have very often, uh, you know, when we first approach this particular topic, uh, we have in our minds that, uh, you know, cults are dangerous, right? They're led by these uh, individuals that have complete control over the members, and they're very often bent on violence of some sort. And we talk about certainly, uh, you know, many groups that have turn to, in some cases, extreme forms of violence, but others have been peaceful. Chen Dao uh, is one mm -hmm. example. And I think, um, you know, one of the questions I ask at the end of the class is, uh, what, what, uh, what was the thing that surprised you the most? And one of the things that comes up very often is, uh, well, the, the thing that I alluded to earlier, that uh, a lot of the new, you know, what we consider to be new religious movements uh, were cults at one time, and, and they have thought about that, particularly mainstream religions today. And uh, also, that not all groups are, are dangerous, that most of them are peaceful. And uh, this notion of brainwashing, which we talk about, uh, is not scientifically valid. It's, it's, uh, it's a, a term that's very often used to delegitimize uh, religions and demonize uh, belief systems that we don't agree with. Right, and, the, and, and in some ways there's no need for that demonization. People are eager to believe something or to make sense of the world as they experience it and so they will latch on to things and they'll they'll install it in their own belief system without necessarily somebody else having to insert it in into their minds as a as a kind of a uh, a chip or as a, a a doctrine yes absolutely uh, it, it's it's really telling when uh, you, you look at most members of new religious movements. Uh, most will stay anywhere from three to five years, and then they leave. And most report, uh, you know, if they have been forced to leave, most report uh, positive feelings about the group, but they feel that it's just time to move on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which makes sense since they moved into that movement at some point out of another tradition or out of no tradition, and uh, the the personal journey often does continue uh, in a different direction. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I would say also the, the other thing that uh, a lot of students allude to that surprises them is uh, sort of the, the makeup of most of the members. I think most of us mm. have a general perception that members of new religious movements tend to be 
uh, disenfranchised in one way or another, um, that they may come from, uh, you know, uh, poor social classes, or they're uneducated, or they're not critical thinkers. And we talk about some of the social attributes of members, and what we find is that uh, many of these things are incorrect, that uh, members do tend to be young. I think that that's not too surprising for most uh, right. most people that are looking at new, new religious movements, but what surprises them is that most of the members tend to be uh, pretty, uh, pretty highly educated, and they tend to come from uh, middle class and upper middle class families to begin with, not the poor like we uh, typically assume. Hmm. That in some ways that they're empowered to uh, go out seeking and experimenting and, and trying on something new rather than being stuck in, in tradition or the old or uh, living life with fewer options. Absolutely. That, yep. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, in, in terms of the materials that students encounter in the course, uh, are they reading primary sources? Are they reading uh, uh, religious texts um, created by the, the founders or leaders uh, of these organizations? Are they, are they seeing films? Do they observe ritual? Uh, listen to music, perhaps? Yeah, so it's a, a 200 level course. And so mm -hmm. I try to keep the, the reading somewhat manageable, particularly because we are moving quickly. Uh, there's two textbooks to the course. Uh, they're, they're not primary uh, materials, they're actual textbooks. Um, I, I split the course up into two parts. So the first part is really um, an introduction to new religious movements and also uh, just sort of laying the theoretical um, uh, framework, if you will. Uh, for the case studies that are to come. And so we talk about things like secularization. We look at models as to, you know, why people join new religious movements. Of course, there's a lot of scientific models out there that uh, try to explain this. And then we talk about why people leave. And then um, we talk about uh, violence and, and some of the attributes that one would need to sort of look at uh, to ascertain whether or not a group might potentially turn to violence. And then from there, we move into the case studies. And then we, we'll look at, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we start with uh, the People's Temple and then we'll move on um, to the Branch Davidians and so on, uh, ending with Chen Dao. And uh, the students, um, they're reading uh, in the second textbook chapters on each of those particular movements. And then they're also, uh, also viewing films. And uh, some of the films, uh, like in the case of Heaven's Gate, uh, the founder of Heaven's Gate, I, I had them uh, watch the video, or uh, let's see, it's I think two videos uh, that the founder put out right before the, um, uh, the suicides. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of, uh, of film and, uh, and reading. Yeah, and, and, and sort of documentary films, I guess, in, the, in a sense. In, yeah, in some cases, yep. As well. Uh, uh, do any of these uh, new movements uh, rely heavily on, on uh, musical forms of, uh, of worship? I know that uh, you've uh, researched and written on uh, Christian rock and roll uh, yourself. Uh, whenever I go down to watch the Albright basketball team at, play at Messiah College, I'm subjected to a good deal of Christian rock and roll there uh, as, as well. Uh, do any of the, of the new movements um, um, pay a great deal of attention to, uh, to musical forms of expression? Yeah, uh, certainly some of them do. I, the, the one that comes to immediately to mind is the Branch Davidians. Uh, David mm. Koresh actually was a, a musician. He, he was actually pretty good. Um, he uh, played guitar, and, and I believe he, he did some session work uh, for a while in California, and uh, would go back and forth between California and Texas. So um, if you take a look at some of the, the videos of, um, of David Koresh and the group, uh, you'll notice that uh, very often uh, music is at, at the center of what they're doing, which makes a lot of sense because, you know, he, he of course, was a lover of music and uh, was himself a session guitarist. Um, the other other uh, groups, I, I don't, you know, off the top of my head, I, as I'm sort of ticking through each of the groups, it, it's, it's interesting you brought that question up. I never really thought about it before, but as I'm thinking through the groups that we cover, uh, the Branch Davidians certainly, um, uh, felt that music was very important in their services. The others, I, I can't think of uh, any instances of where music played an important role. That's not to say that it didn't. It, it might be in, or, or was, and I, I'm not aware of it. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting question, John. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that before. 
Okay, well, we'll, con we'll continue to think about that as, uh, as, as we go forward. Um, have you taught this course dur during the regular session or is this more of an uh, interim experience that, that you want students to have? Yeah, I've taught it uh, in the regular uh, semesters as well. Uh, yeah. Normally I'll teach it in the, um, the interim as well as the summer now. Um, I think I started teaching the course in the summer about three years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, usually about every second or third year, I'll try to work it into the regular uh, semester as well. I, I was initially kind of nervous about uh, offering it so often because I felt that maybe if I offered it, say, in the interim and then again in the summer and then again in the fall, uh, that there wouldn't be student interest. But so far, mm -hmm. it, it seems that there's been a lot of student interest. So um, I think that, you know, conceivably, I could probably offer the course every semester and I get wow. enough students for it to, to go. Um, so well, that's always nice. That's, uh, that's a vote of confidence on the part of students. I, I, I think uh, we advise our students to take s certain classes, but they get an awful lot of recommendation from their peers as well, that this was a great experience. It was fascinating. The teacher is interesting. Uh, you'll enjoy learning about this, uh, this kind of material. I certainly hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you, uh, will you be back in, uh, in, in Reading uh, once February comes along? Or are you away uh, uh, for the, the rest of the school year? Yeah, at the moment, uh, the plan is to come back right before the spring semester. So I mm -hmm. should be back uh, sometime mid-February. Uh, with everything going on, though, who knows? I, I, I did uh, get a phone call from the airline yesterday that I, I wasn't able to field um, because I was uh, busy with family. But I'm assuming that uh, if, uh, you know, if, if history is any note, uh, they probably are calling to tell me that uh, something is amiss with my flight. They've canceled something or something like that. So I might, might uh, not be back for a few days after that, but uh, somewhere right around there. Okay. And what, what will you be teaching in the spring? So in the spring, I, I'll be teaching social theory, which is a course I typically teach every fall and spring. Um, I'll also be teaching the uh, senior seminar, which is another course that I typically teach each fall and spring. And then for uh, my third course, uh, I'll be teaching uh, intro to sociology. Oh, great, good. And, uh, and that's a course, uh, uh, a course that many, many Albright students uh, take as, as their social science. Have you taught that recently or, or are you going back to that after a while? Uh, fairly recently. That's another course actually I've taught online. Uh, I think the last time I taught it in the classroom was about uh, two years ago in the spring. So okay. it's, it's been a little while, but not too long. Great, great. Well, I, I should say that um, when you were hired uh, uh, now 20 years ago, the, the sociology department uh, was, was, was small and was hanging on, but uh, over your tenure here, it's grown to be one of the, the most uh, visible and successful and active and engaged uh, academic departments that we have with, with a lot of really fine students and a, and a wide variety of scholarly interests, research interests on the part of your colleagues and, and, and your students as well, doing honors theses and going on to grad school and, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, congratulations to you, Chuck, and, and, and to all of your colleagues as well that you've helped help to uh, curate and bring together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've been really fortunate to work with uh, excellent colleagues and excellent students as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we all feel uh, pretty fortunate at Albright to have the students that we have. Yeah, so, for sure. Uh, uh, there are things to look forward to in um, uh, 2021. Well, we're just about out of time, uh, Chuck, but I really am grateful that you joined me uh, via Zoom uh, to uh, talk about this fascinating topic, a classic topic really in, in uh, sociology uh, and a wonderful interim course as well. So uh, in, enjoy the slopes, enjoy the rest of your course uh, and safe travels coming up. All right, thank you, John. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, thank all of you as well for joining us, uh, and we'll see you again uh, in another month on another edition of the Albright Scholar. So long.